So in this uh, in this video, we're gonna work on a uh, uh, another example. Uh, the name of this example is called Game of Life, and uh, it's uh, it's something that I found on this uh, website. It's a very interesting exercise. It's about uh, cellular automator. It's something that's uh, uh, very useful in simulations. Uh, that's in uh, many many different areas. They are using this kind of a cellular automator to actually simulate phenomena. That's um, that's in biology, that's in economics, that's in uh, sociology, in ecology, and uh, these kind of simulations are actually used uh, very widely, both in science and uh, engineering. So we're going to look at um, a very simplified example of. Uh, of this kind of calculation, it's called game of life. It's called game of life, and in this kind of simulation, we're basically looking at a particular, a two-dimensional uh, grid, and every cell, every cell on this grid, is either active, which is alive, either either alive or dead. Right? So so every cell actually has a status, which is which is either alive or dead, and then every cell has neighbors. So if we are actually looking at the cell in the center, which is the black cell, then it has uh, has neighbors. And depending upon depending upon how you actually define the neighborhood, the result of the simulation could be very different. And in practice, there are two different types of neighborhood definitions. One is called a von Neumann neighborhood. The other one is called a Moore neighborhood. Right. So so for the von Neumann neighborhood, the center cell has just the four neighbors. And then for the more neighborhood, it has actually eight neighbors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It has eight neighbor, na uh, neighbor, neighboring cells. Right, this one has four neighboring cells. And uh, and the the simulation actually starts with some kind of a setup. So some of the cells are going to be alive. Some of the cells are going to be um, are going to be sort of dead, right? And then it's going to evolve through time. So it's going to take many many time steps. And then it's going to evolve according to a certain rule, a certain set of rules, right? And eventually, uh, when the time step or the time steps finishes, it's going to end up with a another configuration that could be very, very different from the configuration that we started with. So, so, so the important thing is about the rules. What's that? What? What actually? What? What? What kind of? What a set of rules actually de decide if a cell is going to be alive or not, right? So if a cell has fewer than two alive neighbors, again the definition of the neighborhood has uh, two different kinds of definitions, right? We have the von Neumann definition and then a more def uh, neighborhood definition. In in this particular example that I'm going to work on, we're going to use this more neighborhood definition. We're going to so every cell is going to have like eight. Every interior cell is going to have like eight neighbors, right? But but for cells that's on the boundary, you could have a different number of cells. And then later on, we're going to look at how how do we actually define the boundary condition. But for now, let's just look at the, what are the conditions for deciding what are the rules for deciding which cell is going to be alive, which cell is going to be dead. So if a cell has fewer than two alive neighbors, it will be dead in the next time step, right? So if a alive cell has two or three alive neighbors, it will be alive in the next time step. So if a cell has more than three alive neighbors, it will be dead in the next time step. And then if a dead cell has three alive neighbors, it will be alive in the next time step. So that's that's sort of the four different rules that controls the evolution of the configuration from one time step to the next. So if a cell has fewer than two alive neighbors, so it has a it has no it, it has no company or something, and then it will be dead in the next time, right? If it is a it, it if it's a live cell has two or three alive neighbors, then it will be alive, right? It, if the cell itself is already alive and then it has like two or three alive neighbors, then it will still be alive in the next time step. But if the cell has more than three alive neighbors, then you can imagine there might be some competition to the live cell, right? And then it will be dead in the next uh, time step. And then if a data cell has three alive neighbors, they will be alive in the next time step. So that's the four rules we're going to try to implement in our uh, computer program. Right. So so now let's look at uh, what I what are we going to do with uh, with with the boundaries with the cells uh, sort of living on the boundary of the grid. So so we're trying we're going to try to adopt a periodic boundary condition. 
which means that the neighbor for the top row is going to be, be be the bottom row. So so for 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 the top row, for the top row, the neighbor the neighboring row above it is going to be the bottom row. And then for the bottom row, the neighboring row that's going to below it and that's going to be below it is going to be the top row. So we're basically connecting we're basically connecting this boundary with this boundary. Right, so it makes it makes it looks like a cylinder, right? So 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 that's a periodic boundary boundary condition. As we go along this particular direction, as we and we go off the grid, we start from the beginning again. If we go this direction, as we go off the grid, we start from the beginning again, and we apply the same kind of a, a periodic condition on the two sides, right? So so the left boundary, the left neighbor of this particular column is going to be the rightmost column right. and then the right right neighbor the right right boundary neighbor of this particular column is going to be the leftmost column so 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 it looks like a torus basically so our we have actually changed our two dimensional grid to a torus basically so so these two sides are connected and then these two sides are actually connected so so how do we actually how do we actually store those kind of a boundaries for the boundary columns right so how do we actually store this particular row, the top row? Uh, how do we sp store the top, uh, the, the neighbor of the top row, right? So 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 the low so the lower neighbor is like easily stored because that's in the data structure or that that's already in the grid, right? But in order to actually store the uh, the, the 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 neighboring row above it, we have to introduce another row, another row basically, right? And this row is called a ghost row because it does not really exist in our two-dimensional grid. It's something that we created in order to actually store the bottommost row, right? So, so this top row can have a neighbor, neighboring row that's above it, right? So, so we call this a, a top ghost row, right? And we have to sort of introduce a bottom ghost row also. Right, just to store the topmost grid, so that this bottom row will have a neighbor uh, below it, and then we have a left ghost row, left ghost column. This is not a row. The left 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 ghost column, and then right ghost column, right. So that's for the two, uh, for the four sides basically. That's for the four sides, and then we also have the corners, the four corners. So what's going to happen for the corners, right? So for this particular corner, its color is going to be identical to this corner, where my cursor actually is. And then for this particular for 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 this particular corner, the color is going to be identical to this particular corner, right? And then for this corner, the color are going to be identical to this one. And then for this corner, it's going to be identical to this one. So so black means alive, white means dead, uh, in this kind of setup, basically. So that's going to be our boundary conditions. That's going to be our boundary conditions. So now let's look at uh, how we can actually partition the work among many, many different, uh, uh, many, many, many ranks, basically, right? So, so we are implementing this particular uh, example using MPI. So we need to partition the work among different processes or different cores. So we're going to partition the workload according to row numbers. So, so we're going to partition to rows. So each of the rank is going to store uh, a set of a subset of the rows of the two-dimensional grid, basically, right? So in this case, rank zero is going to store the first top row. That's the big one in the middle. And then rank one is going to store the uh, second row. Rank two is going to be storing the third row. And then rank three is going to store like three rows. It's going to uh, store the bottom three rows, basically. So this matrix, this this uh, grid has like a one, two, three, four, five, six. It has six rows basically. So this grid has six rows, and we are partitioning it, partitioning it on four ranks. So if we we divide a six by four, then if it's an integer division, then we get a one, and then the remainder is like two, right? We have a division integer division result of one, and then the remainder is a uh, is a uh, is two. So, so the last two, the remainder, the remaindering two rows are put on the last rank, rank three. So rank three has like a three rows instead of just a one, like every other rank. 
And then how how do we actually communicate, right? How do we actually communicate among different different ranks? So in order to actually update the sales of the top row on rank rank zero, we're gonna need we're gonna need the the, the, the top ghost layer, the top ghost row basically, which is actually identical to the uh, bottom most row, the bottom most row on rank three, right? We are basically have to we have have to send this this particular row from rank three to rank zero, right? So that's the yellow yellow arrow that connects this bottom row to the top ghost uh, top ghost row, right? And then and then in order to actually update the bottom row of on rank three, we have to actually send this particular co uh, row to the ghost row to the bottom ghost row. So that's the uh, that's the blue blue uh, that's the blue arrow, right? And then um, so so and then if we want to update the row on rank one, we're gonna need access. We're gonna need access to the we're gonna need access to the to 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 this to this row to this row to this row. But this row actually lives on rank zero, right? So we have to actually send this row uh, to rank one from rank zero to rank one. So that's this blue arrow here. So in order to actually update this row, we need to sort of send this row over from rank zero to rank one, right? And then in order to actually update this row on rank zero, we also need information from rank one, from this the next row on rank one, right? So so that's the red arrow. That's the red arrow. We need to send this row to uh, to 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 this particular row so that rank zero can have its neighbor's information in order to update its own uh, row, right? So so this kind of neighboring information or different ranks are going to be stored in another data structure that's we called uh, that we we also call it a ghost a ghost row basically. We also call it a ghost row, right? So rank zero is going to store one actual grid, one one row from the actual grid, and then two ghost uh, ghost rows, right? The the top ghost row is actually from the bottom boundary because of this uh, uh, periodic boundary condition, and then the bottom ghost row is actually the row from rank one, because um, its neighbor is actually stored on a different rank, so you need to actually send it over. So so this kind of partitioning requires this kind of partitioning of the two dimensional grid requires to actually send data to send data among those different uh, core among different uh, among neighboring ranks basically to send uh, to send send and receive information uh, between neighboring ranks so rank zero has to communicate with rank one rank one has to communicate with, with rank zero and then rank one has to communicate with rank two rank two has to communicate with rank one right it's all about uh, it's all among the neighbors so you don't see rank zero talking to rank two right Rank zero only talk to rank one, and rank one talks to both rank zero and rank two, right? But rank zero, rank one doesn't talk to uh, rank three, that kind of thing. So it's just uh, c communicating with its uh, um, direct neighbor, basically, the, the, its uh, immediate neighbor, right? So 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 if we actually use this kind of diagram to partition our uh, partition our grid, then 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 we can sort of de define uh, define ranks. Define the neighboring ranks, right? So for rank zero, the rank above it is supposed to be rank zero. For rank one, the rank above it is supposed to be rank zero. The rank below it is supposed to be rank two, right? For rank two, the rank that's above it is rank one, and then the rank below it is supposed to be rank three, right? So we know where the target, the targeting rank actually is. Where do we actually send the information? And then where do we actually receive the information? From, for rank zero, it's gonna receive information from rank three, right? And then it's also gonna receive information from rank one, right? And then for rank one, it's gonna receive information from rank zero, and then it's also gonna receive information from rank two. So we know where the, where, the, the which rank we're gonna receive, receive data from. And then we also know which rank we wanna send our data to. Right, by by just looking at this particular diagram, and uh, in this particular exercise, we're going to practice two kinds of uh, MPI commands. One is called MPI send, and then the other one is called MPI receive. And these two commands are actually um, uh, are actually uh, sort of they must be used in pairs. So so if you use an MPI send somewhere in your code, you must have a corresponding MPI receive. So these these two these two commands must be used in pairs. 
and if you have like 10 send, you must have like 10 receives. Otherwise, you're going to get into a deadlock. So this, this kind of, these two commands must be used in pairs. So, so how do you actually use a MPI send? You use MPI send uh, by following this kind of a uh, syntax, right? So here is a, is, a, is a small example. Send, it's sending just the one value, my value. It's a MPI int, and then it's sending, uh, it's sending to my rank plus one. And then it's got a tag. So, so here it's uh, this, this the one, two, three, four. The fourth input is actually the destination rank, right? It's actually so in this particular example, it's actually sending to my rank plus one. So it's actually sending to the next rank, and then you get a tag. Tag is something used for identifying the kind of message that you're actually using. Uh, you can use any kind of integer to to use it as a tag. It's a sort of a identification of a particular message. Right. This is just a, an example for sending one number. Right. Suppose you are, you are sending more than uh, you are sending more than one number. You are sending 100 number. Right. So it's an array that you are actually sending. So what you are doing is that the the first parameter is the address of the array, and the array the address of the uh, begin the beginning address of the array is actually the the array's name. So it's a uh, my buff my buff. So the the total the count how many how many we have. And then MPI int the type, and then the t the destination rank, and then the tag of the message. Right, it's an identifier for the message. That's how you actually use the MPI send. And then how do you actually use the MPI receive? It's actually quite similar. It's quite similar. So in in, in receive, you specify the pointer to the receiver buffer. So where do we want to store? Where do we want to store the received message? Right. And then the count, how many how many numbers you are actually expecting, and then the data type, that kind of thing. And then the, the rank from the, the the source rank, where the where the data is actually coming from, the rank of the process, uh, where you actually got the message from, and then a tag for the message itself. So here it's actually one uh, receiving one number, you're receiving one number, one integer, right? And the source rank is uh, my rank subtract one. It's currently rank. Uh, it's current rank subtract one and my rank subtract one. So here's an example of receiving 100 integers right, from my rank subtract one. And uh, and and that's basically how you actually use um, use this kind of a, use this kind of a, uh, syntax. So now let's um, now let's look at how we can actually write this particular code. How how we can actually write this particular code. So, so we're gonna create a new uh, directory. Let's just call it uh, game of life, right. and then we switch into that game of life directory, and then we start to write our source code. Um, let's just call it life dot cpp. Right. So some boilerplate codes, codes, boilerplate codes, just a. Uh, we need to include all the useful headers, and then we need to include mpi.h, right? and then we need to using namespace std. That's it, right? And then we need to define our main function, right? Let's write our main function. So it's going to take two inputs, int argc, and then uh, char star argv. And then let's tr to in let's uh, let's try to initialize MPI. And then before we actually finish, let's close it, finalize it, finalize. Right. And then we need to sort of initialize MPI size equals to MPI get size. And then the rank get rank. So now we are getting the size of the MPI, and then the rank that's different. And then we also define a MPI root, and then that's going to be zero. It's uh, the root is going to be 
the process with the rank zero, right? And then for our for our input for our command log arguments, we're going to require the user to say, uh, to give us the three uh, input parameters. Basically, that's the dimension of the grid, the two-dimensional grid. Grid. We need to know how many rows we're going to have, how many columns we're going to have, and then we also need to know how many time steps we're going to take. So 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 that's basically three integers and rows. That's the total number of rows. And calls, that's the total number of columns, and then end time, that's going to be the number of time steps. And then if MPI rank equals to, equals to MPI root, and then the root rank is going to do the, uh, is going to try to get the, try to get the data, get the input data. So we're going to do some error checking. If not equal to four, then we are going to uh, do something to the CER incorrect number of uh, command R arguments for expected and then we're just going to do a hard exit right and and then we can just uh, assign values and rows is going to equal to a to i rgv one and calls is going to be a to i rgv two and then and Time is going to equal to a to i rgv three, right? And then if let's do another error checking, n rows smaller than one or n calls smaller than one or n times smaller than one, we're going to consider those input values to be invalid. Uh, invalid command r arguments. And then we're gonna just do an exit one, and then we're gonna just uh, close this particular if branch. So, so after this if branch, we should be uh, the the root rank should be able to actually get get a get the, get the correct values get correct get the correct values for these three parameters, and then we want to broadcast it to every other rank. So we're gonna just do MPI come word bcast and then the address of an rows that's just the one mpi int and then it's coming from mpi root right and then we're just going to duplicate it duplicate it uh, and then and calls right and calls this many columns and then end time right so so we broadcast the data to every other rank right once every rank actually has an access to the correct row number, we can start to do our partitioning. So we define another variable that's int n rows local. It's going to store the, the, the number of rows that's going to be stored on each of the rank. So on, on average, it's going to be n rows, the total number of rows, divided by MPI size. But it's... Uh, this is an integer division, so the result is going to be a int. The thing is that uh, sometimes it's not a whole number division, right? You may have remainders. If you have remainders, what are you going to do, right? If we're going to put the remaining rows on the last rank, we're going to put the remaining rows on the uh, on the uh, on the last rank. So so if MPI rank, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's MPI size subtract one. If the rank actually equals to subtract MPI size subtract one, we're gonna change n rows local by adding to it n rows modulo MPI size. So this way we are actually putting the the remaining rows on the last rank basically, right? And then don't forget we each of the row uh, each of the rank will have to store two ghost rows. One from the top, the other one from the bottom. So, 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 so the total number of rows is not exactly n rows local. So we define another variable that's called n rows local with ghost, with the ghost ghost rows, and then this one is just equal to n rows local plus two, because we need one ghost row on the top uh, above. And then one goes the row uh, below, right? 
and we also need access to the number of columns and each of the column uh, and then uh, the columns are gonna uh, have uh, ghost columns also so every rank will have two ghost columns so one on the left the other one on the right so it's basically we're basically just uh, uh, using this kind of a we need two ghost columns actually two ghost columns on these two sides so if you, we actually do the partitioning along the rows then every row is gonna have uh, every rank is gonna have two ghost columns right so so auto n column and calls with ghost equals to n calls plus two. So now we can actually, once we have the dimension, we can actually define our two-dimensional grid. We can actually define our two-dimensional grid. We're going to define two these kind of two-dimensional grids. One is for storing the information of the current time step. And then the other one is going to be used for storing the information of the next time step. The reason that we're going to need like two different uh, grids to store two different time steps is because we don't want to sort of mess up our current uh, grid when we are actually doing the updating, right? Because when we are actually updating the grid uh, for the next for the next time step, we may destroy the uh, if we actually keep it in the same grid, then we may destroy the old uh, information. And then the old information might be still useful when we actually try to update uh, a different cell for the next uh, uh, time step. So that's why we need two different grids. One storing the current step time step, the other one stores for the next time step. So how do we actually define a two-dimensional um, two-dimensional grid, right? We basically use a matrix. How do we actually use a matrix? A matrix is basically a vector of another vector, so we can do that, and then it's going to store int. So pay attention to the space here. If you actually put the closing square uh, pointed bracket here, then this is actually a C++ reserved operator. You cannot actually use this kind of operator uh, in your own uh, code. So so you must put a space here in order to actually sort of make C++ compiler recognize this is actually a vector of another vector. Right, so we're just going to call it CUR grid, the current grid. And then the dimension is uh, the number of rows, rows and rows local with ghost. That's the total number of rows. And then how many columns are we going to have? So here we're going to initialize another vector, that's the inside vector, that's the, the number of columns. So here we're calling the constructor. Right, and calls with ghost. And then we're going to initialize every number to zero. And then that's our current grid. And then for our next grid, we'll just uh, duplicate it. And then change the name. Let's call it next grid. Right. And that is our two grids. That's our two grids. So once we have the two grids, uh, we can start to uh, populate the current grid with some kind of random information. We're going to just start with a random, a random set of set of cells, uh, right? And uh, which one is alive, which one is uh, dead? Uh, we're going to sort of uh, decide using uh, random numbers. So four. Our row goes from one. Don't forget. What, why do I want to start with one? Because the zeroth row is actually a ghost row, right? So I start with one, and then I row must smaller than n rows local with ghost. Subtract one. Why do I have to subtract one here? Because uh, the bottom row is also a ghost, right? So and so. Another way of writing it is to change subtract one and then get rid of the subtract one and then smaller than or equal to change this to smaller than or equal to right this might be more clear right so it's going from going from one to uh, the, f the 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 last non ghost uh, row right 
and then plus 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 i row right and then for auto i call equals to one and then i call smaller than or equal to and calls basically right plus plus i call and then cur grid i row i call gonna equal to random number we're just gonna call the random function we're gonna call the random function this random function is gonna give me a random number a random integer that goes from like a zero to like a, a some kind of a maximum number that's just a random draw from that pool of numbers and then I'm gonna modulo two I'm just gonna look at the, if the number is uh, even or odd so if the random number is odd then the modulo two is gonna give me one right one means this particular cell is alive right and then uh, if it's an even number modulo two is gonna give me zero and then zero means that this particular cell is actually dead right that's how I'm gonna sort of populate the the initial grid using some random numbers and uh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty much everything we're gonna uh, we're gonna do for for setting up the grid and then when we try to update the sales we need to use uh, sort of uh, we need to gather information from neighboring uh, ranks so how do we know what what's gonna be my uh, neighboring rank right how do I know what's gonna be my neighboring rank so let's look at this diagram so if it's rank 1 then the upper neighbor is just the rank 0 it's just the current rank subtract 1 the lower neighbor is just the current rank plus one, right? It's that's quite easy. But for rank zero, the lower neighbor is going to be the current rank plus one. That's correct. But the 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 the, the upper neighbor is going to be actually rank three, right? So we need to account for this kind of a situation. We need to account for this kind of situation in our codes. So how do we actually uh, sort of? So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna define two variables. We're gonna call upper neighbor upper neighbor and then it's gonna equal to what MPI rank so I'm gonna use a ternary operator that's gonna look like that so here I am actually asking if my current if MPI rank is equal to zero right if it's true if it's true then I'm gonna use MPI upper neighbor is gonna be MPI's uh, size subtract one that's the bottom that's the bottom rank right so if MPI rank actually equals to one uh, equals to zero then this condition is going to be true and then it's going to take this uh, this value otherwise if this condition is actually false it's going to take the next value that's MPI rank subtract one right let's see if this um, ternary operator what this ternary operator actually means the ternary operator is going to take three three things so, so the, before the question mark, that's the condition we're going to actually uh, sort of decide if it's true or false. So, if the condition is true, it's going to uh, the right hand side is going to take on the expression that's given here. If it's false, then it's going to take the expression that's after the colon, right? So, if MPI rank is indeed zero, then the upper neighbor is going to be MPI size subtract one. Let's see if uh, if it's zero, my my rank is uh, MPI rank is actually zero, then me, which means we are on this particular rank, right? And then the upper neighbor is going to be rank three, right? The upper neighbor is going to be rank three, right? So it's uh, rank three is the MPI size subtract one then, because you only have like a, a four ranks, right? And otherwise, so MPI rank is not the equal to zero. If MPI rank is not equal to zero, which means that we are either on this one or this one or this one, right? Then, then it's uh, it's upper neighbor is quite easy to decide. It's just uh, for rank one, it's just the current my rank is subtract one. For rank two, it's also my rank subtract one. For rank three, it's also true. The upper neighbor is computed like that, right? And then let's define another variable that's called lower neighbor. And then we're gonna use the ternary operator again. So so this but this time the condition is not MPI rank equals to zero. It's gonna be MPI rank. We're gonna compare MPI rank with MPI size subtract one and then question mark right 
if this condition is true, which means we're on the bottom rank, the lower neighbor is going to be rank zero. So 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 zero. Right. Otherwise, it's going to be MPI rank plus one. So this way, we actually get the rank for uh, the uh, for the lower neighbor and the upper neighbor. Right. Once we have these two neighbors, we know where do we want to set the information, and then where do we want to gather information? Where do we want to receive information? Basically, right. And uh, and before we actually enter the time loop, we're going to define two constants. Const int alive is going to equal to one. So one means alive. Const int dead is going to be so zero is going to be dead, right? So these are two constants. Constants means that you cannot change those values. You cannot change those values. Those are just uh, constant numbers. You cannot change them. So we are going to use uh, these two. Use alive and dead instead of using 1 or, or 0. Right? So now let's start the time loop. So for auto i time equals to 0, i time smaller than n time, and then i plus plus i time. Let's close the loop for that's the time. That's the end of the uh, time loop. And then inside of this time loop, the first thing we're going to do is to actually uh, send the information to the neighboring ranks. Basically, send the information to the neighboring ranks, right? So the first thing we're going to do is to send top row above. We're going to send our top row, our top row uh, on the current rank to to the rank that's just above me because uh, the rank just above the current row is going to require that information so if we look at this particular diagram right if you are if my rank if mpr rank actually equals to one so i am on this particular process i'm on this particular rank then i need to send my i need to send my top row because um for rank one you have just the one row right but for rank three, you are going to have like a three rows. So, so let's look at rank three, right? So for rank three, I'm going to send my top row. That's this row, right? I'm going to send it to the ghost, to the bottom ghost row of rank two, basically. So let's try to do that. Let's try to do that. And for rank two, we basically have to do the same thing, right? We have to send the top row. It, since it has just the one row, the top row is just this row, right? We, we have to send this row to the bottom ghost row of rank one, right? That's this row. The bottom goes through. So so let's just do that. Let's just do that. Send top row above. So how are we going to do that? We're going to call MPI send. Stop send. So the sending buffer is going to be what? The sending buffer is going to be current grid. The, the, top, the top row is not really row zero right because row zero is actually a ghost row right so every rank itself actually has a, a ghost row um, above it above its actual information so the, the top most row that has actual information is one right and then we want to start from the, f the zeros column we want to start from the zero we want to send the entire row over basically so we want to start from zero column so current grid one zero is going to give me the element of the first row zeros column and then by appending it prefixing it with amp send i'm taking the address so because the send send function actually requires an address instead of a, uh, an element right and then n calls with ghost is the total number of uh, elements i'm sending over and then all the, all of them are ints right and then uh, the destination the destination is going to be my upper neighbor right and then I'm gonna give a tag that's zero right so so that's sending the top row above and then we need to send the bottom row below send bottom row below so again let's look at this particular diagram right so suppose we are looking at rank 2 suppose we are looking at rank 2 so it has just one row. So the 
so this row is also the bottom row so we need to send this bottom row to the rank below it so we need to send the bottom row to the upper ghost row of rank 3 we have to do this arrow right and the same is true for rank 1 the same is true for rank 0 and the same is true for rank 3 basically so rank 3 has to send this bottom row to the rank that's below it and the rank that's below it is actually rank 0 right so it must send this row to the top ghost row of rank 0 right so now let's try to implement that mpi com m order send C U R G R I D, but this one, what's what's my what's actually my current, uh, what's what's supposed to be the the row row index, right? The, it's n row local. So you have to exclude you have to exclude the ghost row. You don't don't you don't want to send the ghost row your own you don't want to send your own bottom ghost row, right? You want to send the row with the actual data, and then it start with uh, still start with zero, right? And then n calls with ghost mpi inked and then it's not upper layer anymore it's uh, upper neighbor it's a lower neighbor lower neighbor and then let's still give it a zero tag so now you have actually seen the rows to your neighbors now let's try to receive uh, information from our neighbors so what we're going to do the first thing we're going to do is to receive bottom row from below mpi com world dot recv basically and then cur then cur grd current grid right we have to res uh, the, not, not receiver bottom receive bottom row no, so 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 that's our receiver buffer right the receiving buffer is supposed to be a ghost row right it's supposed to be a ghost row so it's in rows local plus one so that's going to be the a ghost row and then zero and then we're expecting n calls with ghost right mpi int and then we're receiving it from from lower neighbor. And then start with zero. Uh, stop with uh, give it an arbitrary tag. And then we have to receive top row from above. Again, MPI C O M M receive. Gonna be zero, zero. Cause with ghost inked, and then it's gonna be upper neighbor, upper neighbor. Let's give it a zero tag. And I think we're done sending and receiving data from our neighbors, right? Um, so so that's setting up all the ghost rows and also all the uh, top and bottom ghost rows. Let's try to set up our ghost columns, right? Ghost columns. Set up ghost columns. So how do we actually set up the ghost columns? All we have to, all we have to do is to actually just copy the first uh, column to the last uh, column, uh, ghost column, and then the last column to the first uh, ghost column. So how do we actually do that? We just do that using a row, uh, using a for loop. So it's gonna be a loop through all the different rows on my current rank. So I row, it's gonna be smaller than n rows local, and then with ghost plus plus i row, and then uh, I'm gonna copy the column over grid. That's the first ghost column, right? It must equal to the 
last code, last, the last uh, data column, right? And then, um, and codes plus one. That's the last ghost column must equal to. The zeros, oh, no, no, the one. Right, that's um, that's the first data grid. That's the data first the data column, right? So that's our ghost column. That's our ghost columns. So here we have finished setting up all the ghost columns. Right. So bef so after doing that. We're gonna have a section that's gonna try to display current grid on screen, right? We're gonna try to write a set of code to do that. But before we actually write this set of code, let's try to finish updating our grid from the current grid to the next grid, and then we're gonna write our display code. Right? We're gonna display the the evolution of the of the grid through through different time steps, but before we actually write that set of code, let's um, let's. Um, uh, it looks like it's quite easy, right? All you have to do is just uh, print out uh, the local grid on your rank, but uh, that kind of printing is gonna scramble up uh, all the different rows. The reason is because uh, all those different processes, all those different uh, ranks, are actually writing to the screen simultaneously. So which one gets printed first? Is purely random, so you cannot actually control which row gets um, which row actually gets printed first. So, so what we are going to do in this particular section is um, is that we're going to we're going to send from, from we're going to send all our local rows to the root rank, and then only the root rank is going to be responsible for displaying for displaying the the, the different rows. So this way, this way uh, it avoids scrambling up. Uh, the rows in different orders, in random orders. So, so, so we're gonna leave this piece of code uh, to the last uh, in, uh, for, for for to implement last. And uh, for now, let's try to write the code for updating, for updating, update, update the grid. So how we're gonna do that? We're gonna loop through every cell in my current, uh, in my current uh, grid. And then for every cell, I'm gonna look at its eight neighbors, and then I'm gonna count how many uh, active or alive neighbors it's gonna have, right? And once I have a count of how many alive neighbors I have, I can actually follow the three, four different rules. Uh, I can actually implement the four different rules. So I'm gonna need uh, I row goes from one, and then I row smaller than or equal to n rows local and plus plus i row and then for auto i co equals to one so the reason that i'm using one and n row is because i'm just looping through all the data rows i'm not actually including all the ghost rows the same is true for columns i'm over only looping through all the data columns not the ghost columns right um, so i Co smaller than or equal to n cos and then plus plus i co. Right. Let me just uh, close the two loops first. So in case I forgot. So this is a four i row and then this is four i co. And then inside of this uh, inside of this loop, I'm gonna set up a new variable. That's gonna keep track of the number of alive neighbors and then initialize it to zero and alive neighbors and alive neighbors so I'm gonna initialize it to zero then four so now I'm it to loop through the neighbor all the eight neighbors of the I row and I call element so so I'm gonna introduce another counter so j row j row equals to i from i row subtract one j row smaller than or equal to i row plus one plus plus j row 
so j row is gonna go from the current row subtract one that's the row above the current row and then two the current row plus one that's the row that's just below it the reason that i'm the reason that i'm doing that is because uh, we are using this kind of we're actually using this kind of more neighborhood right so if i am actually at this particular cell right the the neighboring cell i need to examine the row number is going to go from this one that's the row above it to this one that's the row up, uh, below the current row right and then the same is true for the columns so for for the j uh, j co equals to i co subtract one and then j co must be smaller than or equal to i co plus one and then plus plus j co so so inside of these two loops i need to actually decide if i have found a, a live neighbor right so but this these two loops these two loops are going to include the 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 cell that I am actually examining its neighbors for. So so these two loops are going to go over nine different cells, right? These two loops are going to go through nine different cells. I need to get rid of the cell that's in the middle. So how do I actually do that? So how do I actually do, do that? I use, use the if branch. So if, so j row not equal to i row or j co not equal to I call. So if this condition actually the the the, the entire thing inside of the in, inner parentheses actually is true, then it means that I am not examining I am not examining the the center cell, right? And 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 the current current grid J row J call actually equals to alive right then I got a alive neighbor right so so plus plus in alive neighbors so that's gonna be my uh, condition for deciding if I have found a alive neighbor let me close the two for loops so this one is uh, for J co and then this one is for J row. So after these two nested loops, I'm gonna be able to find how many alive neighbors I have for my current cell that I'm actually examining. Right. Once I have found the number of live neighbors, I can actually go through the four conditions. I can try to implement the four conditions. So if a cell has fewer than two alive neighbors, that kind of thing. So let's um, let's go back to our codes. So what's going to be our four, condi four conditions? If in live neighbors smaller than two, I'm going to have next grid i row i call equals to dead. Right. That's one of the conditions. That's uh, one of the conditions. And then if i row I call equals to equal to uh, alive and and I've neighbors equals to two or five neighbors equal to three. Then my next grid I roll I call is going to equal to alive. That's the second condition, right? And then the third condition, the third condition is what? The third condition if n alive neighbors larger than three, then the next next grid I roll I call is going to be dead. Then the last condition. I row I co equals to equals to dead and 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 live neighbors 
equal to equal to three. Then next grid I row I co equal to, equal to alive. I still need to figure. And I think uh, that's all the different four conditions. Basically, that's the four conditions, right? Okay. So after I actually got the next grid, after I actually got the next grid, right? After I got the next grid, I need to update the current grid. So for the next time step, I need to assign all the values from next grid to current grid, right? But that's quite easy to do. All we have to do is to copy over, right? So we just do a nested for loop. Equals to one, and then I row equals to no smaller than or equal to rows local plus plus I row for auto I co equals to one I co smaller than or equal to and cos plus plus I co then current grid I row I co gonna be equal to next grid I row I co and uh, we are pretty much done for the we're, pretty, we're, we're actually done with the updating so we have finished updating the the grid from the current to the next Right, I finished updating the grid. Right. So now let's go back. Let's go back to our. Let's go back to our uh, display code. So how can we actually display the current grid on screen? Right. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna for 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 non root ranks. I'm gonna send the data to the root rank, and then the root rank is gonna print out its own data, and then it's gonna print out the data um, received from uh, other ranks so 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 if mpi rank not equal to mpi root so if it's not a root rank i'm going to send my data to the root rank right of course the data that's not the ghost data right we have to send the real data so for int i row equals to one and then I row smaller than or equal to and rows local and then plus plus I row and then I'm gonna do a send inside of the for loop right MPI C O M M W O R L D com word dot send the address of my current grid right and then I row no ghost column I want to start from the first column, right? And then the total number is n calls, right? And then MPI int MPI. I'm sending it to MPI root with a tag of zero, right? So that's 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 the code for non-root ranks, right? And then for the root ranks, if MPI rank actually equals to equals to uh, MPI root. So it's for the for the root rank, I'm gonna do two things. The first thing is that I'm gonna print out uh, I'm gonna print out my own data, right? But but uh, let's also print out the time step, uh, timestamp. So I time, I time, and then some kind of arbitrary separator. Right, and then I'm gonna print out my own data. Auto, I row goes from like one, I row smaller than or equal to n rows local. And then plus plus I row. Right. And then for auto I co goes from one. I co smaller than or equal to N cos plus plus I co. Right. And then I'm gonna do a C out current grid. I row I co and then separate them by space. Right. And then once I finish the inner loop, I print out the end of line. And then I'm going to close my outer loop. So that's printing out its own data, right? That's printing out the data that's on the root rank, right? 
and now let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's try to print out the data that's going to be received from uh, every other rank right and then we still have to do another loop so auto we're going to loop through all the different source ranks so auto source rank source rank is going to go from 1 right because the root rank is zero, so every other rank is actually a source uh, source rank. So so source rank is going to go from one to source rank. It's going to be smaller than MPI size, right? And then plus plus source rank. And then I need to know how many sends were sent out by every source rank, right? Because Every rank is actually sending out its own rows, so n rows local is actually different for different uh, uh, source rank, right? So what's actually going to be the number of receives? So auto n r e c v. So it depends upon how many data rows are on each of the uh, non-root rank, which which can be actually computed, right? Which can be computed. Um, so it's basically n rows divide MPI size, right? And then for the for the for the if the source rank is actually equal to the last rank MPI size subtract one, then n receive has to be corrected. Uh, it actually has to be corrected by adding n rows modulo MPI size, right? And then we need to have a vector of ints. Let's call it buffer, buff, right? This is just for 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 storing the received data. Let's initialize it to this many columns and then initialize it all to zero, right? Once we have the receive buffer, we can just uh, do another loop. Loop I receive. That's the, the zero gonna, gonna be so and then I I C V. It's gonna be smaller than N R E C V, right? And then plus plus i r e c v. So this is a loop of receives. We're gonna do this many receives, this many receives. So 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 mpi com world. So the receiver buffer is gonna be buff zero, the address of buff zero, right? And then how many? It's n calls, and then the type is mpi inked, and then the source is actually source rank. Right, and then the tag is zero. The tag is zero. And then once, uh, as soon as actually we receive the data, we want to print it out to the screen. So for, I'm going to do a range for loop. For every number inside of buff, I'm going to do a C out I, and then followed by a space. And then once I'm finished printing out all the number, I do a, I print out an end of line. And that's it. Yeah, that's our entire code. That's our entire code. So let's try to compile it. So MPI C plus plus TD equals to C plus plus fourteen dash O live, and then live dot CPP. So I guess I had some typos and rows local. It's not n row local, right? n rows local. It's n rows no, n rows local. Okay, so now let's try to run it. MPI run, MP equals to say four, and then life. So the first, let's get five rows, five columns, uh, three time steps, right? Oh, looks like I'm having some uh, errors. So it looks like I am having some segmentation fault, which means that uh, I am probably accessing outside of my range uh, for for my storage, uh, for my um, for my uh, memories. So. We need to sort of debug a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is uh, to sort of try to uh, first identify where the error might be, right? Where the error might be, and then uh, make the correction. So 
So the thing that I can try is to actually comment out a portion of the code and then try to identify where the where the problem actually is. So, uh, so, so what I'm gonna do is that uh, I'm just gonna cut out all the entire time loop. Let's see if the problem is actually from the cut from the time loop, right? So the problem still exists. Mm. So it's not from the time loop. Oh, just to paste the time loop back. Um, it's actually starting from before the time loop, right? It's uh, starting from the before before the time loop. So let me take a look. Let me take a look. So where I am, I actually accessing. So so here is uh, where I actually define the two grids, right? So where do I actually access the grid, right? So these two for loops, right? So that's the two for loops. So so the row the row range for I row it goes from one to n smaller than or equal to n rows local with ghost, right? But the size of the current grid is actually n rows local with with ghost, right? So it cannot be actually smaller than or equal to. It cannot be. In fact, I have to just loops through the, the 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 actual the range of the actual data. It's not the have to exclude all the ghosts, right? So so what I have to so so that's that's where I actually did it wrong. I row has to go from one to n rows local. So I have to get rid of the with ghost. And I think that's where my problem actually is. So let me just uh, go back MPIC and then let me run it again. Okay, so it looks like I have fixed this problem. So that's the first time loop, right? That's the that's the that's basically the grid that I started with, right? After like uh, once a time step, it has like just the two alive, two cells alive, and then after two time step, everyone is dead, right? So so let me try to run it again. So this time it's starting with a different pattern. That's the different pattern, right? Different from last time. After one time step, and then after two time steps, so it looks like uh, we got some survivors, right? And then MPIR. Let me try to try again and see if I uh, more survivors this time. So let me let me try a different parameter. MPI run MP4, but this time let's try live. That's with a bigger grid. Nine nine. Let's try like five time steps. Okay, so this time the pattern is slightly more complicated, right? The pattern is slightly more complicated, right? And it's got uh, one, two, three, four, five time steps, right? Five time steps. So that's why it's ending with the fourth time step. And uh, the pattern is a lot more complicated, actually, right? And uh, that's our game of life example.